We have been on Ezekiel for a few Sabbaths. We've got uh, we've got two more messages to go. I can see some of you going like this. Oh, good. We're just about done. Today we're going to Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. And we're going to read the first 14 verses. We are dry bones. We are dry bones. And I want to kind of make the statement that before we come into the presence of Jesus and before we receive salvation, we are. We're dry bones. There's no life in us. Uh, I know people will try to do anything to feel like they can have life. Uh, doing alcohol, doing drugs, doing something that's going to pick them up, something that's going to give them something to be excited about. <laughs> going on uh, roller coasters, doing something that takes them out of this deadness that they're in. And uh, it's unfortunate that people will try to do anything except come to where the life is. So uh, we're going to go to 37, begin with verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of dead well, full of men's bones. Now, what's interesting is there's a number of times in the book of Ezekiel where he is taken in a vision, either to Jerusalem or he sees a vision of God. Uh, later on after this, where he sees the great battle uh, that's going to take place. So he's taken to all these different places uh, to see awesome events that were going to take place. So verse 2, and caused me to pass by them round about. Can you imagine being in a big valley full of men's bones, men's, women's bones, just dry? You know, we could think of maybe Hollywood and maybe some kind of a fantasy movie or maybe even a horror movie and thinking, I really don't want to be in a valley with a bunch of dead bones. I really don't. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd like to be somewhere else. So... He caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, so it's not like they've just died. There's still a little bit of meat left on the bones. There's nothing. It's just dry bones. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O you dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was, as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together bone to his bone. Can you imagine being Ezekiel and seeing all this? All of a sudden, it's not just a big hill or whatever of bones. Something's happening. And now people are beginning to take shape. That's amazing to me. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them above but there was no breath in them then said he unto me prophesy unto the wind uh, in the Greek they would say pneuma prophesy son of man and say to the wind thus says the Lord God come from the four winds O breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live so I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army so now it was not dead men's bones, but you've got an army of people. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off for our parts. Why were they meaning this? Because they were in a place in their history, there was no temple to worship in. They're captive in an, uh, a place away from home, so they're dry in that sense. They feel dead. And uh, we can come to places, brethren, in our hearts, in our lives, where we feel dry or we feel dead. 
when we have life without Christ, it's not life at all. And so this is what they're dealing with. Therefore prophesy, say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, he's not meaning that they're really dead. What he's saying, I'm going to bring you back to life. And where you feel like you're dead, and, and I had mentioned in a, a message before, that when they were cut off from the temple and they're cut off from home, what was there left in life? So they were walking like dead people. So he says, I'm going to give you life. Come up out of the graves. And what he is saying to them, what he's telling us today, why do you want to walk like dead people? Why do you want to live like there is nothing else, uh, like the evolutionists and the, the atheists? Well, when you die, that's it. You're done and you're gone. What kind of life is that? You're living to die. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people. See, he calls them, O my people. They were concerned. And you know, there's another reason for that. They could not worship God anymore. At least not the way they understood, right? If you have no priest and you have no temple, how do you worship God? Where do you go? There is no place to go. So now the Lord's inviting them. He's saying, listen, you may feel like dead bones, but I'm bringing you back to life. And we can have times, brethren, in our hearts and our lives when we feel dry, when we feel dead, when you can feel like nothing seems right. I, I don't feel like I'm in the presence of God. I can go to church, but I feel like I'm just sitting doing nothing. And that's exactly what the Hebrew people were going through this time. He says, I'm opening up your graves. And you're going to come back to me. Oh, my people. I like when he says that. They felt like we've lost our God. We've lost our temple. We've lost everything. He says, no, you haven't. I'm still your God and you're my people. And shall put my spirit in you and you shall live. And brethren, there's no greater feeling in life than when the Spirit of God comes into you for the first time. And all of a sudden, you start to feel alive. And all the things we've gone through in our life, you could have gone to church all the days of your life, but when the Spirit of God enters you, that is a new experience. Amen. And shall put my Spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. So he says, you're in captivity, but you're coming back home. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So what is for us to understand about this chapter is when we feel dead, when we feel like there's nothing worth living for. And by the way, I've told this before and other times that uh, over the last four or five years, suicides have doubled in America. That's because we have people who don't know life, which means you and I need to be telling these people that there is life in Christ. And you know, I think there's a problem for Christians is we can go back into the tomb. We can go back and become dead. I think that's why we have Peter who tells in 1 Peter, I need to remind you of who you are that we are alive, that we are in Christ, we need to be reminded that we are children of the resurrection. That when Jesus comes back, uh, we're going to experience something no one has ever experienced before. But we are now alive. When Jesus talked about He was the life and He was going to bring us that life, it wasn't when Jesus came back again, it was now. We are not dry, dead bones. We are if we want to be. If we're just happy, being comfortable, watching TV. And you know, uh, on my walk, there are some places, I think these guys never turn off their TV. Because any time I go by, there's always a TV on. And you know, I feel sorry for people when they sit, and that's the only life they know is watching TV. And, and uh, I want to encourage us. We've got some good seasoned citizens here who've tasted life, who've gone through life, 
but you have so much to give to other people. And I think of these people who just sit in front of a TV and their brains are wasting away and they're not doing nothing. You have a great ministry in our church. Well, I'm retired now. What am I supposed to do? Pray for the people in the church. Pray for the people in your neighborhood. Go take a walk in the neighborhood and see about the homes. And one of the things I do is I go by houses and I pray for certain houses. Lord, I want you to work in those houses. You've got a work to do. Do you know in Psalms it says for people who are up there in years that you can still be fruitful in those years? I feel sorry for people who feel like they're dead. We don't have to be dead. We are alive. We've got something to give. So even if you're 90 years old or 9 years old, if you know the Lord, you've got something to talk about. Let's go to one chapter back. Ezekiel 36, verses 21 to 28. Ezekiel 36, and I'm guilty of that. Am I living in the resurrection life or am I sitting in the tomb waiting for Jesus to come back? We need to be people of the resurrection because in a sense we are resurrected from the dead where once we were dry bones and we had no hope. When Jesus came into our life, he gave us something worth living for. Not when Jesus comes and says, oh, that's when everything is going to... No, it happens now. So, 36 verses 21 to 28. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I did not this for your sakes. What he's talking about bringing life back, he is giving us life not because we deserved it, he is giving us life because he loved us. And that's what he's saying to the Hebrew people. I did not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen whither you went. In spite of this, I loved you. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. He says, I'm going to do this. And, and brethren, I want us, as the church of God in Hammondville, I want us to be part of a group of people who are telling others there's a reason to live. Why are people committing suicide? Because they have no hope. If we are people of the resurrection, then we have that hope and we have to be able to share that hope with other people. Because if they're not getting from us, they're going to go to alcohol, they're going to go to the TV, they're going to go to pornography, they're going to go to somewhere else where they're going to find something when they need what Jesus is the only one who can offer that. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this forward is because if we just read Ezekiel 37, well, what's the context here? The context is back in chapter 36. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from your idols, I will cleanse you. This is what he has done. You know, brethren, the morning when I got saved was the greatest morning of my life. Because I was dead. And when Jesus entered in, I became alive. Really alive. The world cannot give to you what Jesus can. That's why people keep going back to alcohol, keep going back to drugs, keep on watching TV because they're trying to find something to lift them up and to give them something worth living for. And it's Jesus all along. And brethren, we have to hunger for that. And I want to challenge us to keep searching for that. It's not enough to be filled once with the Holy Spirit. Not, that's not what Acts tells me. Acts tells me I need to go for refillings of God's Spirit. I need to be reminded that I'm a child of the King. I need to be reminded that I have something the world needs. Verse 26. And I like what verse 25 says. I will sprinkle you with clean water. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? We are now clean. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Do you know that you can become saved 
and you can have the joy of that life, of that salvation, and that resurrection experience, and you can go back and have a stony heart again. When we don't live in the resurrection life, we will die again. That's why people leave churches. And you ask, why did you leave? I didn't feel like I was being fed, some people say. Or I didn't feel like there was, there was something worth. You know what the problem is? It's not so much maybe the pastor or the singing. It is your heart. We get drawn back into the tomb. And the devil says to us, Wasn't, didn't you have a lot of fun with your old buddies back there? Maybe that's what you're really missing. That's what you're empty. Maybe you need to go back and start going back to the things. That's what he tries to tell us. And there are people that go back to that lifestyle. Remember how Jesus said, and it also is in Proverbs, the sow went back, the dog went back to the vomit, and the sow went back to get dirty and that miry junk all over again. That tells me it happens. Verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you. Cause means it's not me doing it. It is Jesus doing it. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Do you know that you can keep the commandments of God with joy? Do you know? Can I tell you something this morning? Do you know that you can come to church happy? That when the pastor speaks, you don't have to fall asleep? That when you're singing the songs, it is God bringing His Spirit in you and you have a joy in singing and you say, I never saw those words before. Those words don't mean like they, like they do now. I can sing them and you know there's a beautiful song by uh, uh, the cathedrals. I was thinking about the other day and I thought, I've heard this song so long and then it hit me like a rock to the head. They were saying, I am so happy because my sin is gone. And I thought, why didn't I see that before? My sin is gone. No matter what the devil says, no matter what my memories say, no matter what people tell me, when Jesus takes my sin, I'm free. Now, why can't I live like that? Why do I love the devil to tell me, no, you can't do this and you can't do that. And, and people say, well, I remember what that person did. And your own memories come back and haunt you. And after a while, that joy you had is choked out. And all you're left is a person sitting in a tomb waiting for Jesus to come back. That's not the life he's given us, brethren. And if that is where you are, you need Jesus to resurrect you again. Get out of that tomb. We don't need to be there. We're not dry bones anymore. We're alive. I'm glad you all said amen to that. Let's go back to, is, you know what? We, I, I wish I had that joy buzzer. I'd be pressing that and you guys would be going. Phew. Because it is not when Jesus comes alone that we experience that joy. We have joy now because he has saved us. He has saved us. Not something in the future. And I feel sorry for people that believe I'm only going to experience that joy when Jesus comes back. It's now. We live in a life where the devil steals from us. It's like, you know what? A beautiful steak or whatever your favorite meal is. And we went to this one place in Texas after Saida got her citizenship. We went to this big barn, but it was a big cowboy kind of restaurant. We had these big plates and there were steaks on there that could barely fit on the plate. They had that and they had the salad. You did not go home empty. Boy, you went home full. We can have this beautiful meal or we can sit here and allow the devil to give us leftover garbage from the garbage can. Which do you want to live in? Surprise, there's so many people that go for the other junk instead of taking what Jesus has offered us. Are we living in a land of milk and honey, or are we going to live in the garbage can? That's for you to decide. I don't want to live in the garbage can. I don't want the devil to tell me how I can experience the joy of the Lord. I want Jesus to tell me. I want Jesus to come and say to me, I am so glad I went to the cross for you. It hurt, Wayne, but I want to tell you I love you so much it was worth it all. 
Did you hear that? Do you know that he says that to you every day? I love doing what I had to do. That's why he said it wasn't a shame for him to go to the cross. Because he loves us so much. He wanted us to be alive. Not to be sitting in the pew hoping someday you're going to see the movement of the Holy Spirit so much that the pastor is going to start floating around the, the church somewhere. Ezekiel eleven seventeen 17 to 20. We, we read this a few, uh, maybe about two months ago already. And I just want to go back there before we go and take the three points I want you to understand and then go into the great, the great rejoicing that we have. So Ezekiel 11, verses 17 to 20. Wherefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. See, all Ezekiel has been seeing is the bad news. He saw the corrupt temple. He saw the temple going to be destroyed, right? He's seen all this. And yet Jesus says, or the Father in heaven says, listen, I've got something for you. You've seen all the bad news. Now I want to show you some good news. You are coming back to me. At that point, they had no temple to go. And you, can you realize, it'd be like us. How would you like it if all of a sudden, all the churches are shut down, the government has said, you can't go to church anymore. How would you feel? How can I see my godly family anymore? Oh, by the way, we're confiscating all your Bibles. We're putting you in captivity. You're going to go into a foreign country. You're going to Canada. You're not going to go home to your family anymore. You're going to be stuck in some tundra area and we're going to build you an igloo in the wintertime. That's all you got. They had nothing. And yet God comes forth and he says, I'm putting a new spirit in you. I am going to give you that hope you've been looking for. And they shall come thither and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof. Do you know that when we come to Jesus Christ, he takes away all the detestable stuff out of our life? Sin cannot dwell in you. It is gone. He casts it out. He casts the devil away from you who's been working on you for so long. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take away the stony heart out of the, your, their flesh and I will give them a heart of flesh. Isn't that sound like what we just read about in Psalms, I mean in Ezekiel 37? A heart of flesh. The heart that God wanted us always to have. A heart that looks at someone and feels sorry for them. A heart that loves people. Do you know we were talking this morning, I was listening to you folks in the Sabbath school class when I came in. We we're talking about all of these different things we need to do to get the church. But I think the one thing that they should have brought forward was this. The secret to the success of a growing church is love. When you love God, you will. When you love your fellow neighbor, your uh, people in your family, people in the street, when you love them the way God wants you to love, they're going to be so attracted to come to where you are. That's why we need to be people of the resurrection. Amen. I remember there was one time uh, I was attracted to some person and then I realized why it was because God was living in their life. We ought to have God in evidence so much in our life, brethren. And that can happen if we ask Him to. Where you're all of a sudden going to be attracted. You're not attracted to the person. You're attracted to the Spirit of God in that person. What is it about you that has drawn me to your presence? And then you realize it's because God is there. Why do you think the people went by the thousands to where Jesus was? Because of who he was. We are the children of the resurrection, which means we ought to have that power in our life. Not because of anything I've done, not because of who I am, but because Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is what Ezekiel is being taught here. I am going to help you. Now let's go through the three points here. On your, if you're looking on your sermon notes, we can see three interpretations of this chapter. Number one, this is a literal return of the Hebrews back to their homeland. And we can take that and say, yes, that was. Because we were told by Jeremiah that 70, 
weeks or 70 years were appointed, after that time, Israel was going to be able to come back. If you talk to people who backslide and they want to come back to God, they are only very happy to come back home. Or if you've been out, if you left church for a while and you're saying, life doesn't, and you start coming back because the Spirit of God is gently leading you back in, you become joyful. The Hebrew people were excited because when they were told they're going to be able to come back home, that's where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are. That is where my heritage is. When we come to Jesus Christ and we have forgiveness of sins, we're coming home. We're coming home to a God we've never known before. We're coming home to a family, a church family. We're coming home to a life we've never experienced, but we're coming home. And I love it when I can come into this church and I feel like I'm part of this family. Even if I take too much in the potluck line, you guys still love me and I love you for that. So number one, a little return. That's what the Hebrews were looking for. Number two, a spiritual renewal in the children of Israel. Here we just read in, in Ezekiel 11th chapter, I'm going to give you a new heart. Do you know you can't change yourself and make yourself better? I feel sorry for these people who go to psychiatrists, go to psychologists, go to these weekend seminars, how to be a better you. They can't do it. I don't care what you're taking, what kind of drugs you're taking, or how they're going to say, just tell yourself a hundred times a day, I'm the best person in the world. That can't change you, but Jesus can. He can give us life from lifelessness. That's what Genesis means, and that's what the resurrection means. I'm going to create in you a heart you've never had before. Point number three, he could have been talking about the resurrection of the nation of Israel, because what did Ezekiel see? All these bodies coming back together, am I right? And sinews and all the skin and everything became a great big army. That is a possibility. But I would like to consider the spiritual analogy for us. And that is what is the father talking about in the foolish sense. He was talking about bringing his people back to life. God doesn't want us to die. He doesn't want us to die. Not, we all, we're all going to die, but he's talking about a spiritual sense. He wants to bring us back to life. All the people who ever lived on this earth are dry, dead men's bones. You remember Jesus? He looked at the Pharisees and what did he call them? You're whited sepulchers, your tombs. You are dead men's bones. Why? Because they thought that they could worship God the way they wanted to. And unfortunately, I know of people who are the most miserable people in the world because they want a relationship with God, but they're the one who dictates what happens. You can't have that. When we come to Jesus, you are the master and I am the slave. We don't like that term slave so much. You can say, well, I like the word servant a little better. We are all slaves to the master, which means he tells me and I do. A huge valley, a valley of dead bones and you know, I, we can look at our beloved America and the dead bones are everywhere. You go to Hollywood, they're dead bones. You go to a bar, there are dead bones there. Wherever you go, it's dead men's bones. And the funny thing is, is they want to fool themselves into believing that they're alive. And they're not alive. That's why you have people who wake up in the morning, they're trying to find a reason to keep on going. You know what that is? Because what they've got doesn't work. So let's go to Ephesians 2. It would be a morbid message if I ended right there. Let's go to Ephesians, the second chapter, and verses 1 to 3. Brethren, if you believe with all of your heart that Jesus has saved you, it needs to make a change in you daily. It's not that, well, you know, brother, when I came to Jesus Christ, those first few couple weeks, I felt excited, but then I felt like that drained all out of my life. You know who did that? It wasn't God. We allowed someone else to come back in and tell us what was going on. 
when we live the resurrection life, it is a new life every day. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3. And uh, this is interesting. And you, you, all of us, he's talking to you. Has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins? We're alive. What, did we die again? Are we so in, in love with the world that Paul has to say to us, that, I mean, I think maybe it's a James, friendship with the world is enmity with God? You cannot be in love with Jesus Christ and walk in the world. It doesn't work. You has he quickened. Quickened is, uh, we read that in Psalm 119, 119 a number of times, quicken me according to your word. God, you've got to quicken me. You've got to give me that spiritual excitement for life, the reason to keep going, to have that joy to give to other people. It is the spirit that quickens. We don't. So we've got to be asking, we've got to be seeking, just as when he came into our life the first time and we experienced this uh, amazing life. Are, are, are we going to be so deceived that we live this life like we're dead men walking again? Or are we going to be alive? You has he quickened. And I think you can check in, in the Greek for the passage on that verb. And do you know what it's going to be? He continually quickens me. Now that is different from, well, I came to Jesus long ago, laid him down in sin. Jesus came and took me in. And then what happened after that? I read it is a continually quickening that takes place in my life that makes life worth living. All right? Verse 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air? Gee, do you think that sinners don't know that the devil's got a hold of their lives? The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That tells me if you're a sinner and you don't know Jesus Christ, the demonic spirits are working in you. Am I right? That's what this just told me. That's when you come and talk to a person about Jesus Christ and they get angry with you. It's not the person, it's the demonic power that's in that person that's doing that. Verse 3, Among whom also we all had. That means at one time we were. Our conversation in times past. You got that? Had and past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were that way. We were dead. Brethren, we need to be living. We need to be alive. Now, are you saying, brother, that I cannot wake up sometime in a bad mood? No, that's going to happen. But let me tell you something. There ought to be a joy that looks beyond my present circumstances. I'm glad you said amen to that. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, what, in sins? We were that way. Are you dead in sins now? No, we're alive. Look at that word. Has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. How do we come and live in the resurrection life? Brethren, let me tell you something. It has to be in Jesus Christ. Oh, you mean I just can't come to a church someday and work myself into a frenzy and hear enough music and then I'm going to get excited? You don't need any of that. When Jesus lives in you, it's a blessing to have making melody in your hearts to the King of Kings. But I don't need music to have joy because Jesus is already in us. We don't need to work ourselves into that. Let's go to Galatians 2.20 and we're going to end there. Brethren, we need to realize that we are told by the Apostle Paul and by Peter, quicken, make alive, remind yourself of the promises you have. Uh, let's say you're going to uh, Texas, you're going to San Antonio. What was that big roller coaster? It was, a, it was a rattlesnake or something. What was that called? It was this huge thing. And Isaiah was young. He was what? Seven or eight or nine at that time. Okay. And I looked at this thing, and I know how my stomach feels about that. I do not like going on roller coasters because I'll be done the rest of the day. Well, we, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try it anyway. I got those little, you know those little bands you can get? And they have these little pressure points. 
so you don't get sick. So I tried them out. Uh, they, they work sometimes. We got on that thing, and I'll tell you what, I, I did not want to see that again. I mean, there was excitement on there. We stopped, and Isaiah says, let's go again. <laughs> what? Are you nuts? Let's get out of here right now. I'm not going back on this thing anyway. The experience of being on that roller coaster, you don't stop the roller coaster. Okay, stop. That's it. We're done. When you're in the middle of that roller coaster, it's the same in the spiritual life. You can't stop that. When the Spirit is moving in you, it is a day by day where we are quickened by His Spirit daily. But you know what has to happen? We need to be seeking God for that. When you are hungry, you go to the table to eat, don't you? Let's say you were all day. You didn't have time to eat breakfast. You didn't have time for lunch. And here comes supper. You're hungry for supper. And your wife or your mother, whoever it is, makes the most beautiful meal you've seen. Are you just going to sit there and I'm not going to go to the table? You're going to be driven by something, aren't you? And it's called hunger. We need to be driven by the hunger of the Spirit of God. I want a movement of God's Spirit in my life. The worst thing, brethren, I think that can happen is we become comfortable in a life that no longer experiences the joy of Jesus. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not yet, not who? I. But what? Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is Paul saying? I don't live anymore. I am not living anymore. It is Christ living in me. And that is what makes life worth living. I like that song, He gave me something worth living for. And you know what that was? Himself. I am crucified with Christ. Yet, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Is Jesus living in you? Have you put him on the shelf? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. He's not living in the flesh anymore. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the secret. You wonder what the secret is to having a happy life? I remember we had to read a book, it's by Hannah Whitehall Smith, The Secret of a Happy Christian Life. And all it is, is having Jesus live through you. But I had to, we had to read this book in college. I thought, what do I have to read? It? Why can't I go to the last page of this book? And there's a secret. Because the secret is in us already. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Father in heaven, we want to be alive for you, especially in a world that is dying the way we are dying now. Lord, we look all about us and we see the stories of people who are wandering aimlessly, who are doing things to try and find life and they're not finding it because they're not finding you. Lord, live through us. Change, transform our lives so we are living, breathing examples of the resurrection life. You rose from the grave and when we are baptized and when we give our lives to you and that sin is taken out of life, we are also resurrected out of the dead men into the newness of life and that's the way you want us to live. The newness of life. Not the old lies. Not the old habits. Not the, the one we're listening to who only wants us destroyed. We want to live in that newness that Jesus promised to us. And Jesus, you said you would give us of your spirit. We need your anointing to give us that life. We can't fool anybody else when we're living on dead man's rations. So bring us to life and help us to live that life. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.